Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Drunken Gorilla Painting. In this tutorial today, I'm going to be tackling a Cruel Boys Gut Ripper from the somewhat new Age of Sigmar box set. Without further ado, grab your paints, snag your brushes, and round up an orc from the nearest swamp. Let's get painting. After priming the model in Death Guard Green, we're going to be base coating all of the skin in Death Guard Green. This might seem a little unusual, as of course it's already that colour, but the finish of Death Guard Green as a paint is slightly different than that from a rattle can. In addition, it gives us the added benefit of being able to cover up any areas the primer didn't quite catch as we'd want. Cruel Boy models are draped in what appears to me, at any rate, animal hides, and I'm going to be painting these in three colours, the first of which is pure Gorthor Brown. The next colour is a 50-50 mix of Gorthor Brown and Dryad Bark, so essentially just a darker colour than previously. We're base coating this in the same way, and what's really important in these base coat stages is to make sure that we're being neat. We can obviously tidy up as we go, but the neater we are in these initial steps, the more time it saves us later on. And the third colour is another mix of 50-50 Gawthor Brown and Mechanicus Standard Grey. Not much else to say here, just making sure we're keeping within the lines. The next step for these areas is to pick out the stitches, and we're going to be first doing this with Abaddon Black. We want to make sure that the stitches themselves are completely covered in this, and ideally we want to be getting gaps in between the fabrics as well. Don't worry too much about this though, as we're going to be using a wash later on that does quite a bit of this work for us. After the black has dried, we're then going to be applying a layer of Mechanica Standard Grey onto the stitches to help pick out some of the detail. As a quick note, this is also a good time to base coat the amulet on the model. Continuing on with the theme of base coats, we're going to be covering the shield in corn red. As with all of the base coating previously and yet to come, we really want this colour to come off strong. So even though corn red is a base coat, if you need to, don't be afraid to apply another layer or two. For all of my talk earlier about trying to keep neat in these stages to save time later on, this next step is going to be messy. It's a dry brush of Mephiston Red on the shield to help pick out some of the detail that's there. It's almost impossible not to get some of this red on the surrounding areas of the model because of the way the sculpt is, so all I can really say is try and keep it to a minimum and go back and touch up any of the areas that get covered in the red that we'd already base coated before. There's a fair amount of this wrapping or cord on the models both as a belt and also on his ankles and some of the models on their arms. We're going to be base coating this in Mournfang Brown in the exact same manner as all the previous base coats so far. We're now going to be using Dryad Bark to base coat not only the teeth and mouth, because it should be somewhat dark in there at least, but also the handle of the spear. Any of the areas on the model that are supposed to look like iron or steel, we're going to be getting a base coat of iron warriors on these. Keeping it slightly thin so the paint goes on smooth, give this a couple of coats to get a strong finish. The other metal colour we'll be using on this model is Balthazar Gold. Now on this model in particular there's only a few areas that this concerns, namely the shoulder pad, his earring and the eyes on the scare shield. This is applied in exactly the same way as the previous Iron Warriors. Now 
Next up, we're going to be base coating the teeth with Zandri dust. Try and keep as steady as possible here. If it looks like my hands are shaking, it's because they are. I still haven't gotten used to painting in front of the camera. But try and rest your hands, or at the very least your elbows, against a steady surface. And it does take a lot of the effort out of this. Continuing with the theme of things I find difficult to paint on camera, we're going to be doing the model's one eye. This is going to be hit with a base coat of Mephiston Red. Finally, the base coats are all done, and if you were expecting a wash, you'd be right. The entire model is now going to receive a fairly liberal wash of Agrax Earthshade. This isn't diluted in any way, and I know that a lot of people seem to think that my Agrax Earthshade is diluted, but it's actually not. I would say though, whilst we want the shade to go on as a fairly strong shade, we don't want it to completely drown out the details of the model. So if you do see any pooling be sure to wick it up with the brush. This is something of an intermediary step. It's not actually a step at all now that I'm thinking about it and editing this video. But as you can see, the model has been washed and it's actually looking pretty good. When I was coming up with this scheme, I wanted it to be done in such a way that I could paint the model to a tabletop standard and then come back with more details later on so that I could get it on the table and play with it without having to spend hours and hours getting the entire force done. To this end, I'm going to be doing the base at this moment, so we can get a sense of what the model will look like should it be finished at this point. This is the model post-basing. I'm actually quite pleased with how it's come out, and if you are interested in seeing how the base was done, leave me a comment down below to express your interest. As stated before though, this was more of a tabletop standard, and I want to take the model a bit further. The first step towards that is layering the skin back up with Death Guard Green, focusing on the raised areas such as the knuckles, fingers, arm, and pretty much everywhere that we wouldn't expect to be in shadow. Another layer on the skin, this time a 50-50 mix of Death Guard Green and Ogryn Camo, applied in the same manner as before, with just a touch of water applied to help it flow smoothly, we're going to be doing this on even more raised areas, so specifically areas like the fingers, the upper forearms, the face, and any muscle really that's showing. Next up, we're going to take some Lauren Forest and apply this to the lower lip and under the eyes. We're using this to help set it up for a further stage where we're going to add some highlights to these areas. It just adds a nice bit of tonal variation to the skin. We're now going to use pure Ogryn Camo to highlight areas such as the knuckles, fingers, any edges on the muscle, the details on the face, and any of these long scars you can see on the model. Finally for the skin, we're going to use Kisler Flesh very sparingly on certain areas of the model, such as the lips, knuckles, and any scarring. Be quite sparing with this, but it can add a nice touch of warmth to the orc skin. With that, the skin is finished. We're now moving on to the leather, and we're going to be hitting it with an edge highlight of Baneblade Brown. Small issue here, in as much that I actually forgot to record footage for the other two areas of leather. Now the technique is exactly the same, however, we're not using Baneblade Brown for the other areas, we're using a mix of Baneblade Brown and the previous colour used in a 1 to 2 ratio. So this means, for example, with the dark leather area, we're using two parts of Baneblade Brown to one part of the previous Dryad Bark Gorthor Brown mix. Hopefully that makes sense in the video. We're now going to be finishing the leather with a dot highlight of Ushabti Burn. This is the same regardless of which colour leather you're painting. Try and focus this on the vertices and any really sharp points, for example on the either side of the stitching. Just be careful with this and take a steady hand. Now onto the stitching, we're going to be giving this a highlight of Dawnstone. You can also use this to highlight the amulet on the model's chest. To finish both the amulet and the stitching, we're going to be using another dot highlight, this time with white scar. Focus this on the very edges of each stitch and the sharpest points on the amulet. 
We're going back to the wrappings on the model now with Mournfang Rao. Wherever possible, try and use the edge of the brush to catch these details as it does make it quite a bit easier. Using the same technique as before, use Scrag Brown to push that highlight a little further, leaving some of the previous layer showing to build up that gradient of colour. Finally, we're using Zamasi Desert to do some small dots on the very sharpest edges of the cord, and also we can use it to apply some texture along the length of the rope. We can do this by applying small dots next to each other. We're now starting on the scare shield, which is one of the more detailed parts of the model. This is going to involve a lot of edge highlighting, so just take your time, be careful, and don't be afraid to go back and correct previous mistakes. The first layer is going to be with Mephiston Red. We want these lines to be slightly thicker as they're going to form the base coat for a number of other lines yet to follow. Evil Sun Scarlet is the next colour we're going to use and, as mentioned, we're now going to be using thinner lines to help build up that colour. We also want to be covering slightly less area than we did with the previous Mephiston Red to build up that transition. Next up, we have Troll Slayer Orange, applied in the same method as before, but as you've probably learned to expect by now, covering less ground. One note with the Troll Slayer Orange, it is a somewhat weak colour, not in terms of the actual colour itself, but its coverage. So if you do need to use a couple of layers to build that strong colour up, don't be afraid to do so. Finally, we're applying a dot of your real yellow on the very sharpest corners and the rivets on the red. It's probably not a bad time to mention, I've also been using these colours to pick out some of the detailing on the amulet to give it a kind of fiery glow on the inside. And the same goes for the eye. Going on to the haft of the spear, I want it to have a somewhat mossy look to it, so I'm going to be running some diluted Caliban Green, diluted with water mind you, into the cracks along the haft of the spear. In the same method as before, I'll be running diluted Lauren Forest into the cracks as well. And then finally, we're going to be using Death Guard Green quite sparingly the same manner as the previous two colours to finish the moss effect. We're then going to highlight the spear along its grain using Gawthor Brown. We're going to get some strong lines here to really pick out the detail on the model and as always using the edge of the brush makes this a lot more feasible. The next highlight on the haft of the spear is with Baneblade Brown. Finally, if you feel like doing this, you can do, pick out some little points on the spear, perhaps the little stumps going out from the haft, in Ushabti Bone. We're also going to be using Ushabti Bone to pick out the teeth from earlier. We're now going to start with some of the weathering effects on the metals. To do this, we're beginning with Doom Bull Brown. Now, I'm going to apply this in glazes onto the surface of the metal. As anyone who's watched any of my Death Guard videos know, I probably have a bit of an obsession with this kind of weathering, but what can I say? I'm an addict. What you want to do is dilute the Doom Ball Brown with a fair amount of water. As far as an actual ratio goes, I would guess it's about two parts water to one part Doom Ball Brown, but honestly, let your own eyes be the judge. We're glazing this onto the model in patches, but we're also pulling it towards any kind recesses or details, such as rivets or cracks. The next colour in this process is Mourned Fang Brown. We're going to be a bit more selective over the areas we cover and also try building up some kind of patches almost on the flatter surfaces, such as the spear itself. We can do this by almost stippling the colour. And finally for the iron areas, we're using Scrag Brown really only want to use this on the very most rusted areas. 
so it's particularly close to the rivets, any dinks or scratches in the blades, and any really, really oxidized patches of rust. We're now going to be preparing the bronze areas of the model with a wash of Athonian camo shade. This is more of a wash to tint the color, a bit more to the green blue we'd want from Verdigris. So make sure it's not pooling too thickly on the model, but at the same time, we do want to be able to see a color differential. To start building up that Verdigris effect, we're going to be using a Stegodon scale green in the same manner as that previously on the eye. So again, nice and diluted and pulling it towards any of the detail. The same again, but with Sotek Blue, being a bit more discerning as to the areas we're covering with this. Throughout the rust process and the verdigris, don't be afraid to leave a thinner coat and then go back and thicken it up later. It's much easier to add more than it is to take away. Finally, we're going to be using Blue Horror in the same manner, very sparingly. I really can't stress this enough. It's a very strong colour and it can ruin the effect, so just be sure to use small amounts of it in the very deepest areas of the verdigris. The model is very nearly done, as you can see by this uh, wonderful view of the model, but there's still a couple more steps to go. The first of which is Windsor & Newton matte varnish. Again, you don't have to do this, I just like doing this as I find it helps even the kind of tone on the model and obviously has the added benefit of helping to protect it and once the matte varnish has dried, we can apply the final color, which is an edge highlight of Stormhost Silver. The reason we're applying this after the matte varnish is if you do hit the edge highlight with the matte varnish, it dulls the metallic somewhat, which ruins the effect we're going for. We're going to be using the Stormhost Silver to pick out scratches and the edges on the metal, as we want it to look quite battered. I mean, in all realism, how would you expect an Auroch to care for their arms and armor? With that though, the model is finished. I think it's not an unfair assessment to say that this model would look right at home in a swamp, which I'm taking as a big win. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please feel free to leave a like and potentially even subscribe. And if you didn't, feel free to roast me down in the comments below. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.